Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. This is the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protections Commercial Feed Program, Medicated Feed Manufacturers Webinar. This is the last in our series. We had a six-week series of webinars. Those webinars are, today's webinar is being recorded, and the previous webinars were recorded, and we are posting those to our website. Um, there may be a slight delay in that due to some of the goings on out in public, but we will have those posted to our website for you to go back and view eventually. I'd like to introduce you to our speakers today. I am Heather Bartley, the Feed Specialist for the State of Wisconsin. I will be moderating today's session and we'll cover the tonnage and inspection fee reporting segment of today's webinar. Stephanie Stass, our feed and fertilizer label and sampling specialist, will be report going through the surveillance sampling project results with you. The better part of today's webinar will discuss inspections, and four of our inspectors will assist me in presenting the material to you. James Longo will start off the inspection section of the webinar with an overview of how enforcement works and building cleanliness expectations. Kevin Bry will then cover the drug inventory and storage requirements. Matt Zaski will run through equipment cleanliness and production record expectations. I will give you insight into our feed label requirements. And KJ Dickman will run through the medicated feed label requirements, veterinary feed directives, and provide you with some resources for developing medicated feed tags. Before we get started, I would like to run through a couple housekeeping items. First, please know that you are already on mute. In order to be sure we get through all of the presentation content, we have reserved 30 minutes for questions at the end of the webinar today. You are welcome to submit your questions into the chat box as we go, and we will answer those at the end first. Today we are discussing commercial feed requirements in Wisconsin. We're going to talk about tonnage and the changes that took effect in 2018, the sampling program and what that data shows right now, and how to make tweaks toward a positive improvement in the sampling data, what to expect from an inspection, how the feed program performs drug calculations, and last, we'll go through the label requirements for feed tags. With that, we will start by going over the feed tonnage statute changes that took effect on January 1st of 2018. It is important to remember inspection fees and tonnage are two different things. The inspection fees are monies collected by the department and are assessed based on the quantity of feed sold or distributed. The fee is paid by the business that is first to distribute or sell the feed in or into the state of Wisconsin. Tonnage is the quantity of feed itself. Any person who is manufacturing or distributing commercial feed in or into the state of Wisconsin is required to hold a valid commercial feed license issued by the department. This also applies to persons whose name and address appears on the label of a commercial feed as the guarantor of that feed. However, there are three exceptions to the licensing requirements. If you distribute commercial feed as it was packaged and labeled by a licensed manufacturer or distributor, you do not need a license. If you distribute distribute bulk commercial feed as it was manufactured and labeled by a licensed manufacturer or distributor and repackage the bulk commercial feed into small containers, you do not need a license. The exception to not needing a license for repackaging bulk feed into smaller containers is when the bulk feeds are commingled and repackaged, then a license is required. Last, if you distribute only custom mixed feed using ingredients that you purchased from other licensed manufacturers or distributors, you do not need a license. Please remember, a custom mixed feed is one formulated by the animal producer for his or her animals only, and you as the manufacturer are not representing any nutritive guarantees for the feed. Remember that retailers are still exempt from licensing. When we talk about retailers, we are referring to entities that merely purchase and resell feed manufactured and labeled by a third party feed company. We also want to clarify that with the statute changes, brokerages and distribution businesses that are first to distribute in or into Wisconsin would require a commercial feed license. 
there is a chance that those entities may have been able to conduct business in the past without being licensed. We look forward to working cooperatively to notify anyone who may not have needed a license in the past that may need a license going forward. In the past, the very first person to manufacture and distribute a feed, no matter how many times it changed hands, was responsible for reporting tonnage and remitting the inspection fees to the department. In today's world, that's no longer realistic. In layman's terms, the changes that took effect January 1, 2018, bumped the responsibility to the person or entity that is first to distribute a commercial feed in or into Wisconsin. In other words, if a feed moves from the original manufacturer in California to an animal producer in Wisconsin and changes hands five times along the way, the fifth person that sold the feed to the animal producer in Wisconsin is responsible for reporting the tonnage and remitting the inspection fees. If the feed moved from California to Wyoming to Iowa to Minnesota and finally to Wisconsin, the Minnesota firm is responsible for reporting the tonnage and remitting the fees. Again, the fifth transaction is the only one to report the tonnage and remit the fees to the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture. Along with the change to the responsibility requirement, several other changes were made to the statute. One change was the implementation of a minimum inspection fee of $50 for 200 tons or less including distributions of zero tons. Another change made was the removal of the exempt buyer license status option. This means that no licensee may apply for or receive exempt buyer status regardless of the amount of feed being exported or distributed out of state. In other words, all licensees will be held to the very same requirements. Finally, all credit reporting requirements were removed. While prepaid purchases are no longer required to be reported to the department, please know you can still reduce your tonnage by the cumulative total of commercial feeds and feed ingredients that another licensee first distributed in or into Wisconsin to you. All four changes, the responsibility of the tonnage reporting, the minimum inspection fee, the removal of the exempt buyer license status, and the reduced reporting requirements for credits took effect on January 1, 2018 and have been applicable for reports filed from January 2019 going forward. One last thing before we switch topics, in 2019, the feed program staff worked with a group of industry members to revise and create some documents to help make reporting tonnage easier. The documents are available on our website and are ready for you to print and use. Now we'll, we'll transition to the manufacturing side of things and start by going through feed surveillance sampling conducted by the department. In the years before I started with the department, sample quantities and types were not representative of the feed out in commerce. Staff worked together on a Six Sigma project and ultimately learned that the program needed a higher quantity of samples from my diverse portfolio of feeds to put together a more representative data set. Using that justification, we assembled a feed sampling program that meets those stipulations and is feasible with the resources available. Before we start going through the data, I'd like to point out that pet food, which refers specifically to dog or cat food, does also get sampled. Specialty pet foods, critters like fish, hermit crabs, gerbils, and other cage-type pets that are not livestock get sampled with the livestock feeds as part of the regular surveillance sampling program. Most recently, we conducted a sampling project in 2017 that tested 100 samples of wet and dry dog and cat foods. The summary of the project is on our website. Ultimately, pet food is a sole source diet and it gets run for a full nutrient profile of protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, and amino acids, up to 27 different analytes. When it was all said and done, the pet foods had an 85% passing rate. I'll ask you to keep that number in your mind because we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Feed surveillance samples consist of livestock feeds like cattle, swine, chicken, and horse feeds, 
and specialty pet foods like gerbil, hamster, aquarium fish, and aquarium reptile foods, as well as some single ingredients and drug mineral premixes. The other thing to keep in mind is that no matter how many different analytes or nutrients we run on a feed, if it fails in one, the entire sample is considered a fail. With that, as you can see, the overall sample results are trending at a 58% plus pass rate. I have some additional breakdowns for you, but remember, regulatorily, we have to look at sample results like you see them here. As such, I'm presenting this data to you as a heads up and as an effort to educate and cooperate with you in bringing the passing rate to a better number. Ideally, we would love to see 100% passing, but that's not realistic. We want samples to pass at a rate that is as high as possible, but if we saw the pass rate hit 85% or better, I think everyone would feel a lot better about looking at it up on a big screen like this. Remember back on slide 11 when we looked at the pet food samples and how all 100 of those samples were run from anywhere between 25 to 27 analytes? This line graph shows you how many analytes we ran on a surveillance sample. The bulk of our samples were run for four to nine different analytes. We had some outliers where three samples were run for 15 or 17 analytes, and 89 samples were run for one analyte. Those one analyte feeds are predominantly custom mixes that we only ran for a drug level. Looking at this chart, I personally think that if pet food can pass 85% of the time when run for 25 to 27 analytes, the rest of our feeds and distribution can pass 85% of the time when we run for four to nine analytes. It's just gonna take some tweaks. Think of it as an enormous control panel with hundreds of knobs. No one knob is the magic key to an 85% passing rate. It will take some trial and error and some turning of multiple knobs to get our passing rate up there, but it is achievable. If a person looks at the analytes run on an individual basis, the results are pretty darn good. That just emphasizes the ability to improve to me, since every analyte has a fairly respectable passing rate for the most part. We just need to tweak a little bit to get all of the analytes to pass. If we look at the three primary analytes, protein, fat, fiber, as pictured here, we started out in 2015 and 2016 with only protein struggling to meet or exceed 85%. By 2017, protein was up to 82%, a big improvement in just three years. The fat and fiber, as you can see, were well within an acceptable passing rate. Most recently, protein ran at an 83% passing rate, which is almost to the 85% goal. When we look at the results for the drug analytes, it is important to remember the results are attributable to much smaller sample size than the protein, fat, and fiber. Monensin, which was run on 110 samples in 2017, had a 93% passing rate, whereas Tylosin had a 0% passing rate from, from running one sample. Not great data on the Tylosin. Generally speaking though, the medication analytes look reasonable for the low quantities of them that did get collected and analyzed. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, this is the only data I'm going to run through today for surveillance sampling. If you would like to see additional data, please touch base with someone from the department to put in an open records request for the data. In summary, because the department has to use the overall sample results, we are asking firms to ensure they are utilizing the tips on this slide to help boost the passing rate. Rather than run through these, I'll just let you know that they are available upon request or you can download them from our website. If you have anything that you'd like to discuss with regard to sampling that you don't want to go through in a public setting, please feel free to contact me. Next, we're going to go through feed inspections and what you should expect when your state feed inspector visits. First, let's cover the enforcement activity related to inspections. We field staff try to educate before we regulate and will strive to inform facility staff how to comply before going to verbal or written warnings or civil or criminal fines. It's worth pointing out that the feed program has only recently acquired civil penalty authority in 2017. Prior to that, enforcement actions could only go the criminal penalty route. The department strives for uniformity in all aspects of the 
aid program that is related to what the field staff inspect for, what they are looking to see or what they expect to see and how they utilize enforcement actions when there is a violation. All that said, multiple factors have an impact on enforcement decisions such as employee turnover, compliance history, type of violation, severity of the violation, and most importantly, the health and safety risk to animals and people. In some cases, companies have multiple facilities and that can play a role in the enforcement action decision as well. Let's move on to what to expect from an inspection so that enforcement actions don't have to be a decision with an inspection at your facility. Every medicated feed manufacturer inspection has five key aspects. The main thing as an inspector or that an inspector will look for are a current feed license, cleanliness of your buildings and equipment, adequate control of drug components, proper record keeping, and retention of records, and adequate labels for all commercial feeds and feed ingredients. When the inspector first arrives at your facility, he or she will request to meet with the most responsible person on site. The most responsible person and possibly other employees will be interviewed for the duration of the inspection and will be expected to answer or acquire an answer related to the good manufacturing practice standard operating procedures in use at your facility. Initially, the inspector will do a walkthrough of the facility to look at the cleanliness and maintenance of the buildings and equipment inside and out. The inspector will look to ensure that there is minimal or no evidence of rodents, vermin, birds, or insects. Part of that will include an overview of pest control. If your facility uses its own pest control, our inspectors are educated in the use of pesticides and can answer any compliance questions you may have related to the use of pesticides in an animal food producing facility. Your inspector will be firm on requesting cleanup when necessary, especially with today's heightened awareness of biosecurity related to avian influenza, African swine fever, and other infectious diseases. This is where we will strongly encourage the reuse of bags as biological contaminants are not visible to the naked eye. Inspectors are looking to ensure physical contaminants or potential adulterants, like stored pesticides, fertilizers, non-food grade grease, or clean cleaning compounds are stored in a separate segregated area during the outside walk around. The inspector will be looking for areas that may harbor pests or grant access to your facility, such as significant holes or openings in the wall or floor or overgrown foliage. This photograph demonstrates what we're talking about on the outside of a facility, overgrown plants. Not only does the foliage provide a place for pests to reside, they can also hide access points for rodents and other vermin. Similarly, in the top left of this photo, we see a stack of pallets leaning against the wall. Rodents love to live in those types of materials, especially when there is an access point down the wall, like the holes in the tin of this building in the center of the picture. A wet floor is a strong hint to an inspector that they should look at the ceiling for holes in the roof. Sometimes facilities do wet cleaning and the water on the floor is not because of a leaky roof. Obviously, leaves can damage the integrity of packaging and cause bags to tear and spill or mold in the feed. Feed mills commonly experience bird activity. Inspectors will look to see that the bird population and activity is controlled as much as possible. Bird droppings carry disease like histoplasmosis, which can cause high fever, blood abnormalities, pneumonia, and even death in humans. Histoplasmosis is also suspected to cause a potentially blinding eye condition. Facilities have instituted a variety of methods of control of birds, such as nets, plastic flaps over doors, visual repellents, like plastic predators or reflective bird diverters. The outside walk around will include a look at spillage from outside feed transfer via legs, bins, loading areas, and unloading areas. Spills such as the one in this photo must be cleaned up. The spilled feed attracts the pests we are striving to so hard to keep away, and it can be a source of mold. Dust from regular manufacturing activities is expected and acceptable. However, inspectors are taught to see the difference between fresh dust accumulations and buildup from a long period of time. Remember, the best way to demonstrate an SOP is to have the documentation to support it. It isn't required, and it is still acceptable if your facility is apparently undergoing regular cleaning without documentation to substantiate the routine housekeeping. 
remind employees to keep an eye open for ripped and torn bags. Sometimes they come that way from suppliers. Sometimes someone is texting and driving the forklift. Your inspector is going to work with you. However, they want to see effort at ensuring spills get cleaned up promptly. While walking through the production areas, your inspector will question you about scale calibration, inventory control procedures, and equipment cleanout procedures. Essentially, the inspector wants to know that your scales are routinely calibrated. Most facilities use a third party. Uh, internal calibration can be acceptable too, provided the most responsible party is able to adequately explain the process and frequency of the check. The inspector will also ask for a rundown on inventory control procedures of the facility. As long as the procedures established are able to preserve the identity, strength, quality, and purity, you will have addressed most of the requirements. The other requirement is ensuring that all drug sources are used in accordance with the label. In medicated feeds, the label is the law. For example, if a type B monensin 10 gram per pound is labeled only for increased milk production efficiency in lactating and dry cows, that drug source cannot be used to manufacture monensin feed for any other purpose or species. I'll talk a little more about inventory control in a minute on the next slide. Last, when in the production area, the inspector will ask about your equipment cleanout procedures. We'll go into that in greater detail at several slides coming up. When in the drug storage area, the inspector will request a demonstration or discussion of your firm's inventory control procedures. It is vital that your facility can demonstrate maintenance of the identity and quality of every type A and type B drug source used in manufacturing. In addition, if your facility uses a type C drug source to further manufacture feeds, the department strongly encourages inventory control of that type C drug source. The inventory control requirement comes from both federal and state law. In the guidance for industry number 72, which outlines FDA's current thinking on compliance with non-licensed no medicated feed good manufacturing practices, FDA says the key elements are continuous drug identification and protection, written inventory control, and adherence to label instructions. In other words, continuous drug identification means the recording of lot numbers or some other specific identifying information such as dates, not just the names of the drug sources. Protection means we are looking for segregation so that a drug source doesn't get mistaken for a micro ingredient. Some facilities use a locked room to store drug sources. Others might use a designated, designated area on the production floor, such as one pallet, or one racking segregated from other pallets and racking. Written inventory control is the theoretical aspect to inventory control. Actual inventory control is the weight of the bag and the drug source when set on the scale. The inspector will look to see the actual versus theoretical adequately demonstrates control and that the two are compared with a frequency that would be able to mitigate the animal and human health and safety risks that could arise as a result of an over or under use of a specific drug source. For FDA licensed mills, part of that process would be choosing a level of off that would be that would initiate a deeper investigation into why the actual and theoretical inventories do not align. We call that an established variance. While an established variance isn't required for non-FDA licensed mills, we encourage each facility to consider instituting an established variance as 
a proactive measure to be able to recall a very specific batch of feed quickly and efficiently if the drug inclusion was off or was the wrong drug source. The inspector is going to request a comparison of theoretical to actual. They will want to witness you weigh three, up to three different drug sources and then compare that way to the th theoretical inventory maintained on paper. If the two numbers do not balance or match, your inspector will expect you to be able to find out why there is a discrepancy. If there is still a discrepancy between the actual and theoretical, they will want it to be within the toler tolerance of your established variance. Main points to consider when evaluating the effectiveness of your inventory control procedures include the amount of drugs your facility uses over a period of time. Obviously, the more medicated feed you manufacture, the more frequently you would want to compare the actual and theoretical. The second point to consider is the drug sources your firm uses. If type A medicated articles are the primary sources used at your facility, then you would want to take that into consideration because an off would contribute a significantly higher or lower drug level to the resulting feed. And finally, the requirements touch on the point we discussed in the last slide, which was following the labeling of the drug source. Remember, in medicated feeds, the label is the law. All drug sources must be used in accordance with the label. Here is an example of a drug inventory record from a mill. The document records the name of the drug, Rumensa 90, the manufacturer, Elanco, the potency of the drug, and the weight of the empty bag. In addition, the drug premix lot number is recorded on every line to ensure that each subsequently manufactured feed can be traced back to the original drug source. Many facilities are starting to establish a procedure of weighing the bags before opening them. That's going to increase the integrity of their inventory control because each bag always has a bit of variance from the labeled bag weight. I've heard more often than not, the drug source bag weights are over the labeled 50 or 55 pounds. Over time, the overages from the drug source manufacturer and the bag weights themselves can contribute to an off. Keeping, keeping up with as many different contributors as possible proactively mitigates the risk of an off that cannot be explained to your inspector. Here you see an example of the storage procedures we described a couple slides ago, where the drugs are in a designated area on the production floor, where they cannot be mistaken for a micro ingredient. This is an acceptable storage method. After re reviewing your inventory control procedures, your inspector will look for adequate documentation of procedures related to equipment cleanout. The procedures shall be established for all equipment used in the production and distribution of medicated feeds in order to avoid unsafe contamination of medicated and non-medicated feeds. In other words, your inspector is looking to hear about and see production and control procedures that prevent unsafe contamination of feeds from residual medicated feed material left over in mixers, legs, bins, trucks, baggers, and other equipment. The emphasis of these procedures is the prevention of unsafe carryover. Sequencing, flushing, and physical cleanout are all acceptable ways to mitigate the risks of potential cross-contamination. Your inspector is going to request visual inspection access whenever possible. Here are photos that document the inside of bulk delivery trucks. The top right photo could be a little bit cleaner. There is some lingering feed down by the auger. In preparing for FISMA, I'm hearing that medicated feed carries a static charge that clings to equipment better than previously thought. 
Firms that deliver medicated feed should consider sequencing, flushing, or physical cleanout of the trucks in addition to the main mixers. Use a sufficient quantity of flush material that will adequately mitigate the risk of cross-contamination. Mixers are the obvious piece of equipment when it comes to flushing, sequencing, and physical cleanout. Manufacturing with molasses and or fats can create buildup a lot quicker than a mill that doesn't mix with molasses or fat. Please take that into consideration when establishing equipment cleanout procedures. It may mean that your facility has to tweak the cleanout frequency based on the seasons. Ultimately, we are encouraging these practices because we want you to avoid this. The photo on this slide is a hunk of ribbon buildup material that fell off in a sheet feed. When sampled and run through our laboratory for drug content, you can see it came back with levels of decox, lasalicid, and monensin. Unfortunately, this and many other chunks fell into the feed, which was ultimately consumed by the sheep, leading to their death. The department is often requested to conduct an investigation into situations like the one I just described. It is important to remember the complainant can request a copy of the completed investigation file, and they can also pursue their own case as a civil matter. Production records serve two main purposes. The first is to enable your facility to conduct a recall of specific batches of feed should an issue arise with any ingredient used in the feed. Recently, with the creation of the Federal Reportable Food Registry, we hear about recalls related to copper levels, salt levels, and other issues, including medicated feed levels. A second reason production records are required is related specifically to medicated feeds. Production records help to ensure that sequencing and even flushing occur when medicated feeds and non-medicated feeds are produced in the same mixers. Remember that sequencing and flushing are two procedures in addition to physical cleanout. And all three of these procedures support a zero carryover or zero cross-contamination tolerance of drug residues. Typically, if these procedures aren't written down on paper, then your inspector is hard pressed to have evidence to show that your facility completed those steps. Remember to keep track of production on paper so you are able to show your inspector that you do sequence and flush your mixers when and where applicable. That wraps up the Good Manufacturing Practices or GMP portion of our webinar. The next segment is going to go through the requirements for feed labels, both medicated and non-medicated. Thanks, Matt. Before we go through the differences between medicated and non-medicated label requirements, let's talk about the differences between label types and feed types. As you can see from this chart in regulation, we have three kinds of feed types. Branded, which is also referred to as floor stock, mill formulated, and custom mixed. Let me talk about those three for a minute. Branded feeds, or floor stock feeds, are those feeds your mill formulates and stocks to sell to any customer that walks in the door. There's no special formulation, it's just a standardized feed for a single species, uh, sometimes multiple species, that anyone can buy. A lot of times this will include those feeds that your facility retails for another larger manufacturer. Branded feeds are, as I mentioned a minute ago, mill formulated feeds. Because your mill formulated the feed to meet a specific purpose, it has a nutritional backing to it. In other words, your mill guarantees the feed to provide a certain level of a number of nutrients. It is important to point out that the phrasing branded feeds isn't something you'll find in regulation. Regulation basically points to what we call branded feeds as commercial feed. Well, since everything we look at is technically commercial feed, in order to provide a level of distinction to everyone involved, we call commercial feed that carries the standardized label, we're gonna discuss in a few slides,
branded feeds. That brings us to meal formulated feeds. Remember, we just said branded feeds are also considered meal formulated feeds. What else is a meal formulated feed? The other meal formulated feeds that are not branded feeds are the customer specific meal formulated feeds. If your mill has one or more nutritionists on staff and those nutritionists develop formulas for livestock feeds for certain specific customers, those are mill formulated feeds. They are customer specific for one customer where an employee of the mill developed the formula for just that individual. Our last feed type is custom mixed feed. In regulatory speak, the definition of custom mixed feeds differs from the way the phrase is used in industry. In industry, a custom mixed feed could refer to a feed formula developed by the mill, a third party nutritionist, or even the customer. The regulatory definition of a custom mixed feed is limited to feeds mixed per the customer's formulation using quantities specifically directed by that customer. Custom mixed feeds do not have a nutritional guarantee for anything except the drug level when it is a medicated feed. That leads us to how the feed types are labeled. Branded feeds, remember, regulatorily, that's just a quote unquote commercial feed, are labeled in the branded format. That's the standard tag we're used to seeing with a feed name, guaranteed analysis, ingredient statement, etc. There is no option on that. Branded feeds are all required to bear that standardized format style tag. Similarly, custom mix feeds, remember, in regula regulation, those are the ones that the customer requested with specific ingredient inclusion rates per the customer, are to be labeled in the custom mix format. A custom mix format tag is the invoice style tag that pretty much is a line by line itemized invoice. Again, if it is a medicated feed, the drug level must be guaranteed and the paperwork accompanying the feed must contain the required use directions and caution statements. Finally, we come to mill formulated feeds. Remember, a mill formulated feed can either be for any customer as a floor stock feed or it could be a mill formulated feed for one customer. A mill formulated feed when developed as a floor stock feed must be labeled in the branded format. A mill formulated feed developed for a specific individual customer can be labeled at the customer's option, either in a branded format or in that invoice style custom mix format. It's the customer's decision. Just a quick reminder, remember to enter any questions you think of in the chat box. We've reserved 30 minutes at the end to take your questions. So now that the feed types and the feed label format types are clear as mud, let's walk through a few medicated feed specifics. One big thing to remember when it comes to labeling medicated feeds, regardless of the label format you're using, all of the label requirements for the medication apply. That includes four distinct parts. The word medicated, required to be prominently displayed below or directly after the name of the feed, two, the drug purpose or indication, three, the drug name and level, and four or form five adequate use directions for the safe and effective use of the feed and the precautionary statements. All of the information required for a medicated feed that is specific to the drug, the drug purpose or indication, the precautions and the use directions in most cases are required to be copied verbatim from the FDA drug approval, conditional approval, or index listing. The only thing that varies is the drug level. You're going to see these requirements a couple more times before the end of today's presentation. They're very important. Before we go into the specifics of labeling in general, I want to touch on a couple more medicated feed items. The content of this slide really plays more into good manufacturing practices, but it also plays into labels because it matters how a firm that manufactures type B medicated feeds for further manufacture labels those type B medicated feeds. For both sides, 
Firms manufacturing any medicated feed must follow the label. Some type B medicated feeds are labeled for one single indication or drug purpose. However, the drug may actually be approved for multiple uses or purposes. If the label has only one indication or purpose on it, then that single indication is the only reason that specific drug premix can be used in a feed. It's understandable to feel like the approved indications from FDA should just always apply regardless of what the label says. However, with medicated feed, the label is the law. If a type B medicine feed is labeled for increased milk production efficiency, it cannot be used for increased rate of gain or increased feed efficiency. A mix that will be labeled for increased rate of gain or increased feed efficiency must be manufactured from a different type B minutes and feed that is labeled for increased rate of gain and increased feed efficiency. With that, prior to manufacturing a medicated feed, especially if the formula came from anywhere but in-house, take a minute to review the formula and indication. Make sure the indication is approved for that drug at the level requested and as it's calculated according to the formula. If the formula calls for a drug combination, double check that the combination is allowed under federal approvals. Finally, ensure the label intended to go with the feed to the customer contains adequate use directions and precautionary statements. Specifically, look for something to the effect of feed X quantity of feed per head per day or feed X quantity per pound of body weight per head per day. Use directions that say feed according to your nutritionist instructions are not adequate. All right, so now let's get into the details of the actual label itself. This is an example of a medicated branded format label. Remember, in regulation, it's referred to as commercial feed, not as branded. Within the department, we call it a branded label to distinguish this label from the custom mix label that's pretty much just an invoice, since all feed in our world is commercial feed. Notice there are 10 components to this label. The brand name, the product name, the purpose statement, and medicated claim, which is also known as the drug purpose or drug indication, a drug guarantee, a nutrient guaranteed analysis, the ingredient statement, use directions, precautionary statements, the responsible party's name and address, otherwise known as the manufacturer's information, and the quantity statement. Two slides ago, we discussed the medicated feed label components that are required and consistent between the branded and custom mix format labels. The word medicated, the drug indication, the drug guarantee, and the use directions and precautionary statements. The first half of the label content is related to the nutritional aspects of the feed. For example, the purpose statement identifies the species and class for which the feed is intended, or the species and weight ranges or ages for which the feed is intended. The guaranteed analysis outlines the nutrient values of the feed specific to the species stated in the purpose. The rest of the information, the ingredient statement, the manufacturer information, the net quantity, those are truth in labeling type label components in order to provide full disclosure to the customer. The different label components as you see them on the screen in front of you are laid out in a standardized format and order. It comes straight out of regulation and is consistent across all states. That way, firms can use that format and order of components in a single label for one feed that would be distributed in multiple states instead of developing a different label for each different state in which that single feed is distributed. If you seek assistance with developing medicated feed labels, I encourage you to pull up the FDA Bluebird labels online. Those labels are already formatted like the one on your screen and essentially give you a template to follow. You just have to tweak the drug level, the guaranteed analysis values, the ingredient statement, and include quantities in the use directions wherever they're applicable. 
This is an example of a Bluebird label from FDA's website. It is essentially a template, but not a fillable form type template. In addition, it has a table at the bottom intended to help you complete the use directions with adequate information that is in compliance and within the requirements of the drug approval. So if we take the label in front of you and remove the four medicated label components, we have a branded label for a non-medicated feed. It has the same format and order to the label components, it just does not include the medicated feed information. Obviously, there are still feeding directions and, if applicable, precautionary statements on a non-medicated feed. In this case, it is a feed containing a non-protein nitrogen source, so there are cautions related to the presence of that non-protein nitrogen. The other components have the same purpose behind them as when they are printed on a medicated feed label. They identify the use of the feed, the nutritional values of the feed, the ingredients providing those nutrients, who made the feed, and how much of the feed is in the container. When it comes to custom mixes, the requirements change a little, but the premise is still the same. First and foremost, custom mix feed labels come in a different format. There generally is not any nutritional guarantee behind the feed, aside from the drug level if the feed is medicated. So the purpose of the label is to disclose what the customer is getting in their mix. A custom mix feed label is literally a line item invoice displaying seven items if non-medicated, 10 items if medicated. The required elements include the name and address of the manufacturer, the name and address of the customer, the date the feed was sold or delivered to the customer, the name of the custom mix feed, the net quantity of the entire batch, the name and net quantity or inclusion rate of each individual ingredient in that batch of feed, and any corresponding use directions or precautionary statements for the feed. Then if the feed is medicated, there are those standard four requirements we discussed earlier, the word medicated, the drug name and drug level in the finished feed, the drug purpose or indication, and the use directions and precautionary statements. The larger image on the left is an example of what a medicated feed custom mixed invoice style label would look like. In Wisconsin, you have access to one resource that other ag departments do not offer, the DACAP website. It contains templates developed in Microsoft Excel for you to use to label custom mix feed that contain a drug. The templates available are not all inclusive, however, they do encompass nearly all of the common drugs and drug indications for our state. The image on the right of your screen depicts the medicated feed content for a custom mix feed, except the word medicated, which you can see in the center of the left image. Finally, the last piece related to custom mix feeds is a bag identifier. Bulk feeds only need to be accompanied by the two documents depicted on the left and right of your screen. If a customer requests their feed to be bagged off, then each bag must have a unique identifier attached to it. Look by the red arrow in the upper left corner of your screen as an example. You can see the unique identifier doesn't necessarily need to contain much information, just enough to tie it to a specific batch of feed and the documents related to that feed. In this case, the firm used the customer name and the invoice number. The word medicated is a requirement only if the feed is medicated, and that word must be on every single bag. Some facilities have bags that are pre-stamped with the word medicated. If that's the case, then the word medicated isn't required to be on the unique identifier, although you can certainly add that word onto the identifier if you prefer. Similar to branded labels, non-medicated feeds require the same label content for custom mix format labels as the medicated feeds, minus the medicated information. As we saw on the previous slide, the custom mix feed label is literally a line item invoice displaying seven items, if not medicated. The required elements include the name and address of the manufacturer, the name and address of the customer, the date the feed was sold or delivered to the customer, 
the name of the custom mix feed, the net quantity of the entire batch, the name and net quantity or inclusion rate of each of the individual ingredients in the feed, and any corresponding use directions or precautionary statements for the feed. Just as with the medicated feeds, non-medicated feeds labeled in the custom mix format require a unique identifier when they are in bags. The bulk feeds still only need to be accompanied by the single document depicted on your screen. I want to run through unique identifiers one more time because those seem to be the easily forgotten piece to labeling custom mixed feeds. When a customer orders their own feed, whether it is mill formulated, formulated by a third party, or something they pick themselves, a label is required. For bulk feeds, the label has to accompany the load. For bagged feeds, the main label can accompany the load as long as there's a unique identifier attached to each bag. Most important of all, the content on a custom mix format label is the medicated information. The word medicated, the drug indication or purpose, the drug name and level, and the use directions and precautionary statements. Anything that is specific to the batch of feed at hand can be used on the unique identifier to associate the bags of feed to the invoice and, if applicable, the medicated feed information. If your inspector observes bagged feed on the dock or in the warehouse that is ready for shipment without these identifiers, the product will be placed under department holding order until it is properly labeled. Here are two examples of the way a Wisconsin manufacturer went about labeling bagged custom mixed feed with unique identifiers. The mailing labels can be folded over the string that ties the poly bag shut provided all the content remains legible. There is no wrong way to label a bag with a unique identifier, again, as long as everything is visible and legible. The other piece I would like to stress related to the custom mix format labels is the way the ingredients are listed on the invoice. Quickly, I will mention here that a custom mix format label must least list each individual ingredient out with its inclusion rate on the invoice. There cannot be one line item on the invoice that just states the name of the feed. It must be each individual ingredient Furthermore, each individual ingredient must be listed by the actual product name, not just the general ingredient name. The reason for that is potential recall purposes. If an ingredient is recalled, you'll have a better idea of which feeds use that ingredient and need to be recalled. Now we're going to move on to the last part of our webinar, which discusses drug components, or drug sources and their labels. We mentioned earlier that the label is the law when it comes to feed through animal drugs. Now we're going to dig a little deeper into the specifics. When we talk about medicated feed, it is important to keep in mind the different types. First, there are category one and category two type drugs. The difference between the one and the twos is the withdrawal period. A category two drug requires a withdrawal period at the lowest use level for at least one species in which they are used, or the drug is regulated at a no residue basis or with a zero tolerance regarding, regardless of the withdrawal period status because of carcinogen concerns. You can remember the difference by attributing the W that starts the word withdrawal to the two part of the type. Category two drug has a withdrawal at the lowest use level or a zero tolerance for residue because of carcinogenic concerns. Within both categories, there are type A medicated articles, type B medicated articles, and type C medicated feeds. A type A medicated article is just the drug with maybe a carrier. There is no nutritive intent behind the contents of the package. The type B medicated feed is a premix that has some nutritive ingredients added to the drug, but in order to be fed to animals, the premix must be further diluted. The further diluted version of the type B medicated feed could be another type B medicated feed, or if diluted enough, it could be a type C medicated feed. 
The type C medicated feed is the one that can be fed directly to the animals. There is often confusion between a type B premix and type C medicated feed. I've seen some mineral mixes that are formulated at a type B level with feeding directions as a top dress. That can be sometimes okay, but not always. It depends on the drug approval. As the feed manufacturer, regulators look at you as a professional who knows or has the resources to verify that the drug level in a feed is appropriate for the intended use, whether that is to feed it directly to the animals or take it back to the farm and further mix it before feeding. When verifying drug levels, it is always a good idea to take a second and calculate the drug level according to the formula as depicted in this slide. Sometimes formulas get updated or tweaked and the labels are not updated to reflect the changes. It is really important to make sure we are taking that extra minute to perform this step. I encourage you to take measures that will boost consumer confidence in our industry. Verifying that drug levels are spot on and not over or under medicating animals, regardless of the drug type, is one of those things that can be easily implemented and communicated as a proactive measure of judicious, judicious use of all drugs, not just antimicrobials. Ideally, the drug stated level on the tag matches or is really close to the drug level calculated according to the formula. If you're using a type A medicated article to mix a type C medicated feed and the inclusion rates are just too small to be accurate on the tag, you should consider using a type B medicated feed instead so that the inclusion rates are bigger and allow for more adjustment. The options on tweaking this scenario are multiple. It just really depends on the circumstances. Recall what we talked about earlier in slide 39 related to the label being the law. I'll repeat that indication for which you are manufacturing a feed must be on the drug source label as an allowable use of the drug. Furthermore, it is important that using the exact drug level according to the tag. It is really common for us to see firms manufacturing feed with Rumensin 90 and they are keying 90 grams a pound as the drug source level. Rumensin 90 is actually 90.7 grams per pound. With a drug that concentrated, that 0.7 grams per pound makes a difference quickly. That goes for Bovitec 90. It is not lasalicid at 91 grams per pound. It is lasalicid at 90.7 grams a pound. While that may seem like an insignificant difference, if you think about it, it tends to have a snowball effect. If a type B medicated feed is manufactured as a premix using Remensen 90 calculated at 90 grams a pound, where the goal is to have the premix end up at 1,440 grams per ton, the feed will be included at the rate of 15.98 pounds per 2,000 pound batch. However, we just discussed that Remensen 90 is actually 90.7 grams a pound. Recalculating the drug level using an inclusion rate of 15.98 pounds at 90.7 grams per pound in a 2,000 pound batch, we figure out that the resulting feed will actually be at 1,449.39 grams per ton. While that doesn't seem like a lot, any rounding errors that occur down the road when another facility uses the premix to manufacture a type C medicated feed will result in another off. While a slight off does not seem like a big deal, if this was a Tylosin type C medicated feed, the window of approved levels is very small at eight to 10 grams per ton. Or if the firm is trying to formulate a medicated feed at the very high end of the range of approved levels, they could end up having an unapproved drug level because of an off. Long story short, keep the calculations in check using the level as reflected on the tag to assure your customer that your feeds meet guarantee. We have come to the last segment of our presentation related, related to veterinary feed directives. After I go through this, we'll open up the lines for questions and provide contact information for you to reach us if you prefer to have a private conversation relating to your questions. Hopefully all this is mostly review for you. Please remember that the phrase VFD can be referencing a drug or a document. For the purpose of this presentation, we're going to be talking about the VFD orders or the document. Everyone has been very successful in properly retaining records for two years. 
that's one year longer than our typical medicated feed requirements related to non-VFD medicated feed labels and production records. There has been huge improvement with VFD orders reviewed as part of our state inspections. VFD orders are generally including all the 14 required components. There have only been a handful that received guidance from the department, meaning we sent a letter to the veterinarian to remind them of all the required components that are supposed to be on the VFD order. Remember, distributing a feed containing a VFD drug without all the VFD information is a violation of the feed rule. Remember to verify that the proper affirmation of intent box is checked relating to combination feeds. A feed containing a pesticide for fly control is not considered a combination feed. The pesticide, when used in a medicated feed, is considered a food additive. The fly control is acceptable to use in the feed, even if it is marked not to be used in combination with any other drug. Veterinarian, veterinarians have commonly been including additional information on their VFD orders related to animal locations or size of the animals. Please just remember that you can decline to fulfill any VFD order as your right to decide to do business with any customer. However, you cannot require veterinarians to include the animal weights on the VFD order. That's not a requirement by law. This is just a second reminder that Bluebird labels are available via a couple different resources to assist you with development of medicated feed levels, labels and verification of drug uses and levels. Most of you already know about templates provided by the department. Unfortunately, those templates are not all inclusive and take a long time to develop. If you need help for a different drug, you can Google FDA Bluebird labels and drill down to the drug manufacturer label template for a type B or type C medicated feed with any drug source. You can also reference 21 CFR 558, the federal regulations that contain drug approval information. However, the language is not always easy to understand or read through in a limited amount of time. Some quicker, more user-friendly references include medicatedfeed.com, a web-based compilation of drug approval information and template tags. The compendium, which must be at least 2017 or later, so that the changes from the veterinary feed directive regulations are in the document. I believe the Brill tagging software has some medicated feed information in it and can be and can also help you out. I'm not very familiar with Brill, so I'd like to direct you to a resource I'm confident has more information you need, like medicatedfeed.com, the compendium, or FDA Bluebird labels webpage. Last, some of the drug manufacturers offer Bluebird labels, the same ones you'll find on the FDA website, on their websites. The downside to this resource is that the labels available are limited to those that the company manufactures. It is not a comprehensive list. It's still a good resource though. If you develop your own medicated feed tags, it is important to remember to double check that the VFD drug caution statement is on the label. The statement is only required on labels of drugs like oxytetracycline, tylosin, or tetracycline. Thanks, KJ. Thank you to all of our speakers. We have rallied together to present six weeks of feed webinars for you. This wraps up our last one. And we'd like to open up the lines for questions now. Doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat box. Um, would like to encourage you to write down our contact information that's on this slide in front of you. Again, I'm the specialist, Heather, so I can answer any commercial feed questions that you might have. Stephanie works in feed and fertilizer, um, and she works primarily in sampling and label review, so she can answer any of those questions for you. And then Andrew Del Santo is the fertilizer feed and containment unit supervisor. He'd primarily be available for fertilizer questions at this point. Um, eventually, he'll be available for feed questions as well. And as you are all located in Wisconsin, your inspector's contact information is available at the link at the bottom of this slide. Your inspectors are excellent resources to you as well. 
So I'm still not seeing any questions in the chat box. I would just like to remind everyone that you are more than welcome to call or email us with questions, ask us for resources, um, and remind you that this webinar, among the other two webinars, the, the types of webinars were the non-medicated feed manufacturers webinar, the pet food webinar, and then the rest of them were all similar to the one that we presented to you today, the medicated feed manufacturers webinar. They're all going to be recorded, or they've all been recorded, and they're going to be posted to our website. Again, slight delay in that just because of what's going on with the virus situation, but we will have those available on our website. The pet food one is already out there. The other two, the non-medicated and the medicated manufacturers webinars, those will be posted eventually. So just kind of hanging out here and delaying ending this webinar, just make sure no one has any questions. Um, can't really think of anything else to give you as far as what we have today. So um, not seeing any questions, I will open up the line for a few minutes and unmute everyone. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to speak up. So not hearing any questions, I would thank everyone for your participation and attendance in today's webinar. I would ask that you complete the survey we're about to send out. The feedback that you put in that survey will be important to the presentation of future webinars as well as to a couple other projects that the FEED program has going. So if you would look for that email containing a link to a survey, it's really brief. Uh, 10 questions shouldn't take you long to complete and we would welcome your feedback. I do try to utilize your feedback and in the feed program, and so please take a few minutes to complete that when you get it. And I hope you have a great rest of your week and stay safe.